Keep going. <laughs> Facebook, but whatever. You guys can watch that part. We'll watch Here we go again. Start. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, had some technical issues there, folks. Getting back to you now, though. Um, so, good evening, everybody, and welcome back to our Sunday night offering of Astronomy Outreach, the Sunday night astronomy show. Uh, first of all, I'd like to welcome back our regular co-host, Royal Astronomical Society of Canada member, Mr. Paul Owen from Hampton, NB. Hey, Hello. Paul. <laughs> From the Moonshadow Observatory in Hampton. That's more. That's like a it. suburb of Sussex, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry, we're having yeah. trouble playing this video. Good stuff. Okay. Um, I'm not going to touch it. You guys can watch. Uh, and, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Mr. Mike Powell from the PFO Observatory here in St. John. Good evening. So. Oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh. 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 Observatory. Oh, boy. One of them nights. <clears throat> ah, okay. So uh, it's all looking good. Okay, good. Yep. I'll, I'll carry on. And I can't see uh, my end of Facebook. I can see YouTube's up, but you guys can watch that part, I'm sure. Okay. Yep. Well, we got another busy show for you here tonight, folks. Uh, tonight we're going to take a break a little bit from the spacecraft uh, missions segment uh, to help answer some questions uh, from a request from one of the followers of the page who was looking for more information on how to find their way around the night sky. Uh, so we're going to start, because we're getting into summer now and people are out more often now, uh, we're going to take a look at using the Big Dipper as a signpost um, to other constellations and to follow up with a little uh, look around uh, at what to expect uh, in the night sky over the next month or, or over the rest of the month, I should say. So that'll be coming up shortly. Also on tonight's program, uh, in our part of the world, the weather can change very quickly. So uh, it's really important to know as much as you can about the forecast before venturing out that evening. Uh, well, Mike has a new tool to help us with that, and he'll be discussing uh, that with us on this segment of the show. Uh, and on Mike's binocular target of the week, uh, Bino Bud will be back again, uh, this time with a view of the coat hanger asterism. Uh, and yes, the object uh, does look like a coat hanger in space. And uh, It's right next to the closet nebula. It is. It is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway. Uh, 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 yeah. <laughs> and, and Paul will be presenting us with another interesting Rosanna's Fun Facts episode. And we'll yes. have all of your wonderful photo submissions to share as well. Uh, so sit back and enjoy, folks. Remember, this is a family friendly, family friendly <laughs> live broadcast. <laughs> Get that in there. Uh, so if you have any questions about the night sky, we're happy to try and answer them here for you as well. So uh, let's get started with a look at using the Big Dipper as a signpost. And that'll be for me. In the signpost. Inside. Here for you people. Me, me. not blind. Okay. You give up your day job. Oh, you did give up your day job. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, okay, I'm going to share the screen. And I'm going to see if I can do a present now. I'm sure I'm from beginning. You let me know if that shows up for you guys. It looks good. All Let's right. See if we can there we are, using the Big Dipper as a signpost. Um, I mean, the Big Dipper is one of the most familiar constellations for all of us anyway. Uh, and it's this time of year, it's kind of laying up on its handle, I believe, right now. Uh, but uh, it can act as a signpost for us to find other things in the sky, like we did with the Orion constellation in the wintertime. We ran through how Orion can act as a signpost. <clears throat> this is our summertime uh, signpost. So let's take a look at what I meant by that. Uh, this one, okay. Oh, could I drag this one down here? Oh, come on. Yeah, I know, I know. 
Technical issues. <laughs> Crazy. Here we go. Okay. There you go. <clears throat> well, so constellations in our night sky can serve as signposts, uh, showing the way to other constellations and objects. And one of the best, really, is the Big Dipper in Ursa Major. Of course, it's, uh, Ursa Major is the Great Bear, but the Big Dipper is what we call an asterism, uh, which Mike is going to talk about a little bit in his uh, binocular bud talk. Uh, so the Big Dipper and Ursa Major, the following pictures help show us how it's done. So let's take a look at the Big Dipper and everything around it here. So first of all, we start by drawing an imaginary line through the last two stars in the bowl. That's them right there. And they will lead you up to Polaris, which is the North Star. And if you continue on from that, you're going to reach the Great Square of Pegasus. Uh, and then if we took another imaginary line and went through the first two stars of the handle, uh, intersecting through Polaris again, we would end up at Cassiopeia. And if we continue that on, we're going to end up at the Andromeda Galaxy, which sits right there. Yeah, the W uh, of Cassiopeia, the second part of the W, actually points down to Andromeda Galaxy. So if you're looking for Andromeda, it's right there. Believe me, it's there. On a clear night. Uh, next, uh, we can draw an imaginary line through the top two stars of the pot. That will lead us up to Capella, uh, which is the twinkling star in Auriga. And in the opposite direction, take the tree, uh, three stars, not the tree stars, sorry. <laughs> take the, the three <laughs> tree stars in the handle and draw an arc to Arcturus. And then we spike down to Spica. Arcturus is in Booties and Spica is in Virgo. Uh, from there, we're going to draw another imaginary line um, to the right, diagonally. Uh, through two of the pot stars to uh, end us up to Castor and Pollux, which are the twins of Gemini, the heads of the twins. And that same diagonal line going in the other direction will lead you down to Hercules constellation. And right about where it's pointing right there is M13, or Messier 13, which is a nice uh, globular cluster. And finally, uh, if we draw an imaginary line upwards through the two stars in the pot that are the closest to the handle, uh, you'll end up directly at uh, Deneb in Cygnus. So that's that. That's that one. Is that that's called Cygnus, right, Paul? It's called Cygnus. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the stars of the Summer Triangle, uh, drawing the same line with an arc to the left, and you'll end up at the bright star Vega in Lyra, the Harp. And an imaginary line uh, straight down through the two same stars in the pot leads you right to the star Regulus uh, in the constellation of Leo. So there we have uh, Gemini, Auriga, um, Pegasus, Andromeda, Ca uh, Cassiopeia, Polaris, or I'm uh, sorry, or Ursa Minor, uh, Cygnus, Lyra, Hercules, Boides, Virgo, Leo, and Ursa Major. All in that. Uh, all using that uh, uh, Ursa Major as your uh, as your signpost, so works very very quickly, very easily. So if you get out underneath the sky, you can uh, take a snapshot of that or print it off or whatever you like, or you can go to St. John Astronomy Club uh, website sjastronomy.ca, and if you go down the left side there, you'll see the same uh, presentation called "Use the Using the Big Dipper as a Signpost." And there's all kinds of information on this page. It's a very well laid out page with uh, active uh, Links all the way down either side of the page. So a great spot to get you started. Now, if we spin back now to take a look at the night sky itself, this is our night sky tonight at 10 o'clock. And what do I see here? I see there's Ursa Major here, and uh, we lit up to Polaris and right on to, uh, to Cassiopeia. Uh, we go in the other direction. We went down to Booties. We spiked down to Spica and Virgo. We made an arc to Arcturus, first of all, then Spike to Spica and Virgo. Down through the two stars here that end us up at uh, Regulus and Leo. Up through the two stars, we actually end up at Draco as well. But we can go straight through that and end up at Cygnus, uh, Deneb, one of the uh, stars of the uh, Summer Triangle. Uh, so lots, lots there to see. Uh, these two stars in the handle, if they follow them down, they get us to Gemini. Uh, where the Mars Mars and the Moon are sitting right now. Down here, closer to the horizon, we've got Mercury and we've got Venus. 
just about to set at, uh, at I guess this is 930. So it's just about to set then, but uh, Venus is actually coming up higher in the sky and it's going to meet Mercury here in about another week or so. So that's that's our night sky overhead. And that, yes, that can be daunting, uh, but if we break it up into pieces like uh, like we did there, that, that will tend to help you out a lot. Another way is to look for things uh, like uh, these, which are called asterisms. And an asterism is uh, a shape within a constellation or a shape of a constellation that might look like something else, but it's not really a constellation. So this one, for instance, is the teapot of Sagittarius. So Sagittarius the archer uh, actually has his bow here. He's pointing it towards the, scor the scorpion, Scorpius. And the back part is coming down this way. So this is what we see in the night sky. These are, this area here that's drawn out by stars. But we also see this uh, little teapot here. So here's the handle of the teapot. There's the, the pot itself. There's the, the, uh, the spout. And here is the lid. And we usually say coming out the spout is a steam, and that's the Milky Way. But anyway, but that that's in the southern part of our sky. This is uh, showing the night sky in August, so it's in the south in August, but it's actually uh, starting to pop up, I believe, now uh, early morning still. So, but we can use these things as as uh, as signposts as well. And if you can't find the constellation of Sagittarius, maybe you can see that shape of the teapot. It does stand out pretty clearly. Another one is uh, the fish hook in Scorpius. This is another popular one. So we can see here the scorpion with his tail swinging around there, and it looks kind of like a fish hook. We, that's about as much of it as we see from uh, our part of the country. If farther south, uh, you wouldn't see as much. No, farther south, you would see more of it actually, because it's facing the southern part of the sky. So, but that's about as much as, of uh, scorpion as we can see from our vantage point. Uh, another one is the W of Cassiopeia, which is right over here. This W of stars here, um, and the great square Pegasus as well, which is this large square that sits here. Now for me, I go, I count out two stars and up two stars, and I end up at Andromeda Galaxy right there. You can also use the W of Cassiopeia, the second part of the W, the V, that points down to Andromeda as well. So, so these are just parts of the constellations. They're really not the constellation, but they're parts of them. Um, here's the circlet of stars in Pisces as well. Uh, from there, we can go to the Summer Triangle, which is these three stars here made up of uh, Deneb, Vega, and Altair uh, in Cygnus, Lyra, and uh, Aquila, the eagle. And they make up this large triangle here that's usually directly over our heads uh, in uh, August. A little bit later in the evening, I guess, but it's there. And the north it's also the shape of the Northern Cross. So uh, if we look at Cygnus itself, it ends up being more like a cross shape. Very easy to stand out. I'm not going to talk about what's down here, am I, Mike? Not right now. No, no. no. Okay. <laughs> so uh, this is the north. Yeah, this is the this is the Northern Cross, and this is the triangle that makes up the Summer Triangle. Again, these are asterisms, not constellations, but uh, familiar shapes to us, possibly. And, of course, the Big and Little Dipper. Uh, this is actually called the Mini Hook Dipper, this little one that sits out at the end. But um, if we take the Big Dipper and we take the last two stars of the bowl, they'll point us straight up to Polaris, and that's the first star, of course, in the handle of the Little Dipper that goes backwards. Because a lot of people can see the Big Dipper, but they have no idea what the Little Dipper is. I've got that a lot, and it's a lot fainter. Uh, there's usually about seven stars that stand out here uh, from our location, St. John. We might see four of them. Uh, when you see all seven, you know that you're in a pretty dark spot. So so that's a little bit of, on asterism. So hopefully that'll help you. Not only can the Big Dipper be used as a signpost to find other constellations, but it's also pointing directly to Polaris as well. Now, if you want to talk about planets, um, this is a view of what's happening uh, May 16th, which is today. This was, a, this was this afternoon, but really doesn't matter too much about the time there. What I was really kind of pointing out here was the, the, the rise and set times of the planets. Mercury rises at 6.57 and sets at 22.45. Venus, 6.38, 21.53. We'll work our way down through. So we can see that um, uh, Mercury sets at 22.45 and Venus sets at 21.53. So Venus sets sooner than Mercury, so Mercury must be higher. Uh, Mars doesn't set until after midnight, so it's even higher than Mercury in our in our evening sky. 
Um, then we have Jupiter rising at 2.48 in the morning, and Saturn rises at 2.05 in the morning. So it's coming up before Jupiter. Uh, Uranus and uh, Neptune, we're not going to really talk about them too much because those are planets that you're going to need a telescope for anyway. But these are all uh, naked eye viewing, all of these. Um, the other thing that to look at here is uh, something called opposition. Uh, and if we, we can't be opposite uh, these two planets because those are inferior planets, but we can roll out to Mars and see that the opposition of Mars, the next one coming up, is in December the 8th of 2022. That's when the, uh, the Sun, Earth, and Mars are all in a line. So that's when it's at its best viewing. It's up uh, early evening and it sets or, or early morning. So when um, the sun rises, uh, uh, Mars sets, and when Mars rises, the sun sets. Uh, Jupiter this year, opposition for it is going to be July the 14th. I'm sorry, August the 19th of 2021. <coughs> so late August uh, for that one. Uh, August the 2nd will be uh, um, Saturn's opposition. So these two, when they're at opposition, they're at their best and brightest as well. Um, unfortunately, at that time of year, the ecliptic is really low, uh, so they're not sitting very high in the sky, but uh, we're at our, our shortest distance between us and uh, those planets um, at that time. So their viewing uh, is usually the best then. Uh, let's move on from here, and I'm going to go to one slide here, which is one that these guys have seen before, but um, I kind of make it up. Uh, this is coming from the Heavens Above website, including that uh, that last uh, table that I had there, heavens-above.com. And uh, when you get there, you can up in the top right-hand corner, you can type in your location, um, and uh, it'll ask you to update it. And when you do update it, then you'll get this table uh, under planets. This one is actually called the Solar System Chart. So this is the location, the current location of all the planets in the solar system right now. So we can start with the sun here in the middle. We've got Mercury, we've got Venus. A uh, yellow circle there is Earth. Uh, we have Mars. They all sit in this little square. And then we've got Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto. So we're going to talk again about the, the, the worlds that we can see with our eyes right out to Saturn. Uh, and all of these planets all rotate in a counterclockwise direction like this. So everything's going around the sun in this direction. And we are actually rotating counterclockwise as well. So if you can get this part in your head, looking down on top of all the solar system, if you were above the solar system looking down, this is what you would see. We know the position of all the planets right now. So if I was standing right here on, on Earth and I wanted to see uh, what it looked like or what I was going to see uh, in the evening sky, then I would, I would come around this way, and oh, here's the sun. So the sun would set. It would be off my right shoulder, for instance. And then what would I see first? I'd see Venus first, because that's in line with us. And then the next one I would see would be Mercury. Then the next one I would see would be Mars. So is that true? Well, there we are. So the first one we see is Venus. Next one is Mercury, and then Mars. And that's tonight at uh, 9.15. So the sun has set already. First planet up is Venus, next one up is Mercury, next one is Mars. Let's go a little farther. Uh, if we look at the outer worlds, uh, Jupiter and Saturn, so we've, we've gone around this direction. The sun is now set. Uh, we, we had uh, Venus first, we had Mercury, then Mars, and we're going to continue our way around this way. And all of a sudden, we're going to see Saturn and Jupiter. And they're going to appear before sunrise. So, is that where they sit? Well, there's Jupiter and Saturn. So, Saturn is up first, first one we see, and then Jupiter's up again, and that's at 5 in the morning before sunrise. So, that's how they kind of fit together. So, the rise and set times are, are important. If you want to find out what's going to be up in the night sky, not only can you use a program like Stellarium to find your way around that, but these tables can also help you... Um, find your way around and find out what's up in the evening sky. So I'll go to this uh, this chart quite often, not only for the rise and set times, but I'll also want to know uh, when the planet is in superior conjunction. Superior conjunction means that it's us, the sun, and then the planet on the opposite side. So for instance, uh, Uranus now uh, just came from behind the sun on April the 30th. Um, so that's that's an important one to remember. Inferior conjunction is when the planet is between us and the sun, and the only, there's only two planets that can be between us and the sun, and that's Mercury and Venus. 
the next uh, or the inferior conjunction for uh, for Mercury is going to be on June the 10th. It only takes 88 days to go around the sun, so uh, it it uh, cycles quite often there. Uh, it was, the last one was on February the 8th, and then uh, Venus doesn't uh, transit between us and the sun until January the 8th. Every once in a while, we'll, we'll get. Uh, the planet will line up exactly with the sun and us, and we'll get what we call a transit. Uh, so the the small planet will pass across the face of the sun from our point of view. <clears throat> and Mercury uh, happens about uh, 13 times a century. I believe it's not till 2150 or something like that before we get to see another one for Venus. Uh, and then this uh, this one here called brightness is going to tell us how bright the object is in our sky. Minus 3.8 is Venus, so we usually compare it against Venus. The minus, the, the larger the minus number, the, the brighter the object is. And it's uh, exponential as well. Uh, so Mars is not quite as bright as Venus, we know that. Mercury is not going to be quite as bright as Venus. Uh, there's Jupiter, it's rivaling Venus, but not still not as bright. Venus is the, the third brightest object in our sky behind the Sun and our Moon. So that table becomes very useful if you're if you're going out to take a look at uh, what's out there, and it'll also tell you what constellation the uh, planets are in at the present time. So, really nice and really uh, really handy. So that's that's about all I was going to say about uh, about learning your way around the night sky for now. <laughs> I'm going to stop presenting here. Oh, there you are. Hey. Okay. Catch all the out there. Are they carrying vaccine needles? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Only in Seneca. <laughs> Astro in Seneca. Astro <laughs> Seneca. Astro Seneca. <laughs> oh, that's good. So if you can get your head around that planet drawing there, uh, when you look at the solar system chart on heavens above and pretend that you're looking down on top of it and then picture yourself standing on that circle somewhere, and as you move around, you're going to see different things popping up in your sky. That's that's uh, that's the idea of finding the planets, and using the Big Dipper as a signpost uh, can really be handy for you. So if you take that page, go to our Saint John Astronomy Club website, sjastronomy.ca, and uh, you can go down the, the the side there. You'll see the Big Dipper as a signpost. Just take a page and take a picture of it, or print it off, or whatever, and take it out with you. So, hey, anyway, that's my talk about that. So next up. Yeah. Uh, next, hey, who's going to be next up? That would be Mr. Mike. Mr. Mike, Me? yeah, let's go right. with your talk about a weather station. Sure. Uh, everybody, you know, I started thinking anybody that owns an observatory should have a weather station. But the more I think about it, uh, anybody that does astronomy should have a weather station. I know when you go in and you look at the weather network and places like that, or you watch CBC News, it's almost like they don't have a window to look out when they're forecasting the weather because whatever they tell you is a week ahead is going to be the opposite when it actually gets there. You now, I look for the nights to see if a night's going to be cloudy or not, or if it's going to be raining. It tells me five days of sunshine and you end up with four days of rain. So, to me, if you get your own weather station, you can start tracking your own weather and chart it. You can actually look back and then guesstimate what it's going to be like in the future. I thought it was pretty cool. So I was going to do an unboxing, but I thought, well, I'll just show the main part. This is the main portion of the weather station here. And what it consists of is uh, wind direction, an anemometer for wind speed. Here in the center, you have temperature and humidity. And then on the back, you have a rain gauge. And for some reason, they put a level on the top. But by the time you get this 15 feet in the air, you're not really looking over to see if it's level or not. <laughs> Just, uh, you, know, you have to assume that you've got it relatively level. The one key portion is, and this is the part that you're sticking up, uh, make sure it is pointed or oriented north because your wind gauge is going to be pointing north to start. And then from there, obviously, your wind gauge is accurate to whatever way the wind is blowing. So you have to orient your weather station to the north. Now, this is just the main piece. And I want to pull up a screen and show you exactly what this is all about. Present now, entire screen. This guy, share. So this is basically what you get as a weather station. You get the... The uh, 
outdoor portion, let's call it, with the anemometer and the wind speed indicator, humidity and temperature and, and rain gauge. And you can mount that just about anywhere, but you don't want to mount it too close to, say, you know, a wall or a chimney because that will deflect the wind and you'll get different readings than you should get. Uh, when I was actually looking at uh, connecting online to uh, some software I'll show you in a minute, they ask you how high above the ground are you putting it because it changes the calculations that come out. So I put it, I'm putting it on a pole 15 feet above the ground with nothing around it. And it just so happens I can stick it at the far end of my observatory and I won't have to worry about the scope uh, taking a nice shot of it because it's actually from the angle, it's still below the roof line. So it, it won't interfere with my telescope. The second part you get with it is uh, this piece here, which is the collecting unit or the data center. This sends wirelessly all the information on the weather station to this uh, piece here. And it's a surprising amount of information that comes with it. It'll tell you date and time, but it also tells you the uh, moon phase right here. So you can just at a quick glance know what the moon phase is going to be. Uh, it tells you if it's going to be sunny, cloudy, rainy, and it predicts on this chart here. So if these dots are going down in a straight line, then that means that the barometric pressure is dropping and you're coming into some weather that's going to be probably a little nasty or a little rainy. And if they're going up the other way where the dots are getting higher and higher and higher, it's moving more to a high pressure area, which is going to be a nice day. It gives you heat index. It gives you indoor and outdoor temperature. It gives you sunrise and sunset times. The uh, anemometer tells you the direction of the wind speed or the direction of the wind and the wind speed. But it also tells you if, uh, if it winds up to just a gust or not. So you can go anywhere from, I got it set in mind for miles an hour, from two miles an hour to, you know, all of a sudden it'll jump to 20 and back to two again, but it'll show you that you had a wind gust of 20, which is pretty cool. Then it tells you uh, indoor temperature and humidity and outdoor temperature and humidity. Now, all of that comes into this unit. This unit plugs in with a USB cable to my computer and sends it to this software, which is the weather tool that comes with it. And it tells me, again, uh, just from sitting behind my computer, indoor and outdoor temperature, humidity, indoors and outdoors, wind speed and direction. Now I'm showing no speed, no gust, or no direction because I don't have the station outside sitting in a box behind me. But it is, uh, the batteries are in it and it is running. It'll tell me daily rainfall, relative humidity and pressure and all that good stuff. But I can also export it to the weather underground. And once I export it to the weather underground and I leave it, it goes live. And yeah, pull this up. You should see it here. The PFO Observatory. And it shows a map of exactly where I'm at. Uh, the number that you see here, 71, that's the temperature. But that's actually the temperature inside my room here because I haven't moved the weather station outside yet. It's still sitting in a box. So it's 71 degrees in a box. But actually, it shows my location exactly where the weather station is going to be. Current conditions, if this was outside, uh, again, tells you dew point, humidity. Uh, you want to know what the dew point is because if you're going to go out for a night, it'd be nice to know when you're going to start fogging up or not. Uh, you can look at temperature, wind, and pressure conditions. If there's any rain lately, uh, <laughs> what the UV risk is, but at night, you don't have to worry too much about that. And then there'll be an associated webcam going out there. I'm going to hook up my all sky cam and I'll be able to look at it live. And then you can go back and for a particular day or a month or whatever, you can chart the whole system and you have full charts live. And I thought that's cool. Now I got something that I can watch from, from anywhere. I can pull this software up on my phone and I can tell you what the conditions are going to be in my backyard. And then after you start, graphing and uh, collecting all the information, you'd be able to do just what they do at, uh, on the weather network and stuff and start predicting what you may have ahead. Now, it doesn't give me anything to do with clouds, but usually if a low pressure area is coming in, that brings clouds with it. If a high pressure is coming in, that pushes the clouds out. That means low pressure is a dirty day, high pressure is a sunny day. And you get all that information for your own personal observatory, your own personal backyard. And you can look at it anywhere in the world, anytime you want, 24-7. And that, to me, is a cool setup. 
And once I get the camera hooked up and it shows here, I'll, you'll be able to see what the night sky or the daytime sky looks like from my backyard with the old sky cam hooked into this one. So I thought that was pretty cool for the sake of anywhere around $100. You can have your own personal weather station that gives you all this information and you can look at it anywhere in the world anytime you want. So uh, I got another weather station out there now, but that just feeds wirelessly to the kitchen. It doesn't give you any PC connect. If you're going to look for a weather station, you know, that's affordable. They run around 100, 100, anywhere from $100 to $150, unless you want to spend some big money and buy a Davis, which uh, Davis is probably the most professional weather stations out there, and they're not, they're not cheap. But guess what? They tell you the exact same information. Now, the one I have out here on my observatory now has been running for five years. I've only put a set of batteries in it once. And it's very similar to the one that I'm putting out behind me. So you get a lot of time off a set of AAA batteries. They go forever. Some of them have their own solar panels hooked to them. So it will charge your, your you know, you put your rechargeable batteries in it, and it will charge them while the sun is up out there. So I think if you own your own observatory or if you're, you know, just one of those weather buffs like I am, it's nice to have your own personal weather station. And it's just a, a cool thing that you can relate with, and, you know, in your own backyard. So I'll just drop these down. This one here is called a Lagia. Uh, there are numerous types out there. Lacrosse makes them. Acura, uh, Acura makes them. Uh, they're all pretty much the same. I think they're, most of them come out of the, the same place uh, in China. But every one of them that I've had, and I've only had well, two, they've been very, very, very dependable. The first one I have was Lacrosse. The one I have up there now is a Lacrosse. But this one was 30 bucks cheaper than Lacrosse for the exact same thing with the PC Connect. So I went with this one to try, and I'm going to give it a shot and see where it takes us for weather stations. But that's a, a quick little blurb. I thought, you know, something, if you're going to get into wondering, you know, not trusting the, what you get for weather out there, why not put your own weather station in the backyard and keep track of your own weather? So, Awesome, Mike. There you go. That's a pretty cool rig. <laughs> Make you want to go buy one. <laughs> only cool in the winter well i'm thinking you know uh, right on the top of the observatory roof just put a, a board going sideways on the a and that gives me a place to mount it and yep. just know as i can turn it towards the north and it doesn't matter if the roof's open or closed because if it's open it's on the far side of the roof that pushes away from the building so yep. it'll never ever be in the way and what a great thing to have when you're because because that station that you're talking about like the electric the data portion yeah that, that's that can be in your house i'm guessing yeah it's all wireless to that so there's no wires hanging down to get caught up in the roof and then you can go online and look at it on your phone if you set it up like that so you could even have it on your cell phone so you yep. don't have to be in the house to say you get that same data no you can download to your pc your tablet or your phone that is friggin awesome <laughs> you know, for for a hundred bucks, it's a neat little rig to have, and then you can collect all that data and keep it as history and look back at it. Yeah. Awesome, yeah. So yeah. Well, and you know, for those cheap, um, I shouldn't say cheap, to buy just the basic one that you put outside on your your door and then in your house, just a little too. You can know if whether it's snowing out, the temperature outside, the temperature inside, the time, and that. Yeah. Um, they're like 30, 40 bucks. So for an extra 60 bucks, you've got like way more information. Lots more. You just want to make sure that uh, if you are getting the one that it has PC connect with it. Yeah. Right. Because uh, that way it plugs in via USB to your PC and then the PC software does the rest from there. Yeah. So there's nothing that that weather station outside needs. Uh, you say it's got to plug into a computer. No. The, the portion that I have in here, that, that panel... That plugs into the computer with a USB. That would be the one you hang on the wall or whatever. So I just said it. Yeah, it, it takes four double A's, okay. and then the unit outside takes three, or sorry, three triple A's, and then uh, they're rechargeables. But I just uh, this one doesn't have a solar power panel on it. Some of them do have a solar panel on it, and uh, they say you can get three and four years out of the batteries. I'm getting at least two years out of a set. You know, out of three triple A's. In, the, in a little bit cheaper system than this, I hadn't changed the batteries in two years. Yeah. yeah well, I, know, forever. 
the, uh, the little system I have, like what I was telling you about, yeah. Um, yeah, it's like well over a year, year and a half before we're going to change batteries. Yeah. So that's nothing. I mean, that's unbelievable. Now, mine, instead of hooking it, I, when I first had it, I had it hooked to the roof and it went back and forth with the roof. Now I have it set just out on the outrigger so the roof just rolls past it and stops. Yeah. But again, it's not high enough that it's in the field of view of the telescope. The roof still blocks it. Yeah. So, you know, it's, you're not going to look up trying to get our tourists and there's a weather station in your way, right? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. So, yeah. What I like oh, is the cool. fact that it didn't show any wind gusts there in your in your space, Mike. So that was great. Uh, <laughs> that's because it's sitting <laughs> in the box behind me. <laughs> well, that's because Mike hasn't had any chili today. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> Speaking about Actually, what's behind, I did have chili today, believe it or not. <laughs> Speaking about what's behind, Mike, there, the Darth Vader, there's doing a handstand, I guess, today. Yeah, oh, yeah, he's, so yeah. he's doing his workups. <laughs> 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 Always something. Okay, uh, Paulie, would you want to start out with your? Uh, how would we go to a Rosanna's fun facts talk? Yes, right, we can do that. Time. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. Let's see if I can pull this off. I've been doing pretty good lately. You have but been. You have been. We'll see. You know, I, I'm not going to say on tonight, but we'll find out. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So uh, we are. It's time for. Oh, it's time for. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> see you My, spoke uh, too soon. Remember, remember when I said I had to uh, download a uh, yeah. VLC thing? <laughs> uh, there we go. All right. Now I'm going to try that one more time. Uh, okay. Let me just get this up here. That uh, didn't work out so good, did it? All right. Now it's time for Rosanna's Fun Fact. Hey. hey. Welcome back, Rosanna. And Rosanna has got a great fun fact for us tonight. And uh, I'm actually uh, enjoying each and every one of them, and this one is no different. So, <clears throat> so tonight, she, Rosanna writes, hi, Paul. Life on Mars, again, there's a, seriously a huge amount of data coming from Mars and the space Tiger King. Uh, Ron Gabriel Joseph has made some pretty exciting claims. In the magazine Popular Mechanics, there is an article announcing an upcoming paper that will be suggesting that mushrooms are growing on Mars. Wow. <laughs> so sure. in a new paper, an, an international team of scientists from countries including US, France, and China have gathered and compared photographic evidence that claim shows fungus-like objects growing on the red planet. Now NASA's Opportunity and Curiosity, Curiosity rovers plus the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter's high-rise camera, the objects in question show chalky white colored spherical shaped specimens, with the Mars Opportunity Team at first stated was a mineral called uh, hematite, or hematite, however you want to pronounce it. So later studies have refuted that claim of hematite, and now it is thought by a group of lichen and fungi experts that the shapes resemble the puff balls we have here on Earth. A white spherical fungus belonging to the phylum Basiodiomycota. Yeah, try to say that one again. <laughs> uh, so the researchers claim that Martian wind did uncover, let me show you the other photograph, I'm going to blow that up while I'm talking about it. There we go. So that. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, that, uh, that what Martian wind didn't uncover the the uh, um, amorphous, amorphous spheres, and they did expand in size or conversely change shape more uh, and move to new locations and or wane in size um, <clears throat> and nearly disappear. Many of these ground level spherical spe specimens also have stalks or have shed portions of their outer membranes, uh, possibly um, crustose, and are surrounded with white chunks. Let me just show you the next photo here. There we go. Uh, surrounded with um, uh, white chunks and fluffy spore-like material 
that may consist of lepros, which are types of fungi grow, grow forms that create scales and they flake. So the scientists acknowledge that the evidence they presented is, isn't ironclad and seem to predict the scrutiny that will inevitably come with their paper writing that similarities in morphology are not proof of life. You know, back to the thought correlation is not causation, etc. It is possible that all specimens presented here are abiotic. Abiotic means physical, not biological, and not derived from living organisms. We cannot completely rule out minerals, weathering, and unknown geological forces that are unique to Mars and unknown to the uh, and alien to Earth. However, growth movement, alterations, in location, and shape, consistent behavior, and coupled with lifelike morphology strongly support the hypotheses there is life on Mars. Now, let me just blow that up for you. Mm -hmm. So this is a biotech firm in New York that has designed a plant-based packing material to replace styrofoam. This material is made from mycelium, which is basically the root structure of mushrooms. This is a bottle of wine from Ikea using the mushroom packaging. On top of the packaging, packing material, mycelium is also being used to make protein-rich substitutes and vegan leather. So with a little stretch of imagination, one could write a science fiction novel involving a settlement on Mars where everything uh, is constructed of mycelium and cream of mushroom soup <laughs> is the soup du jour every <laughs> single day. <laughs> Isn't that something else? <laughs> every day. Oh my gosh, I just, that's just probably one of the most amazing things that uh, Rosanna spun in. I really enjoyed it. So that was this week's. <laughs> Rosanna's Fun Fact. Hey! Oh, thank you so much, Rosanna. Awesome. <laughs> thank you, Rosanna. so good. It's always so good. I'm going to have mushrooms with my steak now. <laughs> Mars <Marsh> mushrooms. <laughs> mm. nom, 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 nom. <laughs> Magic Mars mushrooms. <laughs> <laughs> if there's mushrooms on Mars, it got to be magic. It's a <laughs> Uh, okay. How are you, face? <laughs> Excuse me. Anyway. Good stuff. Yeah, thanks for yeah. that. Cream of mushroom soup every day. Somebody was asking about changing the batteries on the weather station, so I'm just going to quickly pull up a picture here and show. Tell me if you can see that. Yep. yep. There's the weather station from the ground to the top, so only eight feet high on my observatory, so... A small ladder, you can go up and change the batteries, no problem at all. Yeah. And then same with this one, but this powered from the inside. That's my all sky cam. And then the second weather station is going to go out here on a pole over here. So it's not hard to change the batteries at all. Very, very simple. Awesome. Yeah. Mine's the same. Mine, mine's, uh, mine's actually shorter than yours. So. Yeah. But yeah, it's not, it's not like I'm climbing up a 40 foot roof to <laughs> change a set of batteries. Eh? <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, get, get the long-lasting ones for sure, if that's the case. Yeah, yeah. Not the dollar store ones. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, Mike, I think it's time for Vinyl Bud. Well, he's been waiting in the back there, just okay. uh, pleasantly waiting to, to come up tonight. And uh, let me see if I can... Oops, I hadn't... Uh, we got I got to present first. A little bit of announcement at the end of the show there, folks, too. Present entire statement. Uh, Screen this screen, and then uh, over here. There we go. Have I got the right one? There's vinyl bud. There's vinyl bud. All right. So vinyl bud's target tonight will be an asterism called the coat hanger or Brocky's cluster. And believe it or not. That's what it looks like. Oh, you're seeing the wrong screen, are you? You're seeing my double screen. We are. Yeah. Let me fix this. Okay. 
How did I end up doing that? Present now. Tell your screen. Uh, I know how. Got to move you over here. And I got to bring this up. Of course. Of course. Technical difficulties at my end. <laughs> okay. Now I want the screen. Now you should only see the one. Hopefully. And you've already seen this one. So the coat hanger. And it actually looks like a coat hanger, believe it or not. The Brockies Cluster is also known as Colander 399 or L. Suffies Cluster. It's a random grouping of stars located in the constellation Valpecula near the border with Sigita. The members of the star cluster form an asterism which has given rise to the name as Coat Hanger. And it does look like a coat hanger. So how do you find it in the sky? I would suggest now you wait till about 11 o'clock at night because it doesn't get dark until then, pretty much. Uh, sun sets at, what, 8.30, quarter to 9 now? So by the time it, uh, you get some nice dark sky, it's about 11. So at 11 o'clock, you can walk out, look 90 degrees due east, and you can actually now see what we call the Summer Triangle, which consists of Vega, Altair, and Deneb. Now, an easy way to find it, once you see all three, is you can look at Vega and Altair, draw a straight line between the two, and about two-thirds of the way down, you will find the coat hang. Or, if you look at the Northern Cross, just Cygnus, and boy, we're saying Cygnus a lot tonight. Yeah, I know. You go through the <laughs> dam on down through to Oberio, and just if you continued almost a straight line down, you would find the coat hanger. So what does it look like? Believe it or not, and this picture is not upside down, my binoculars were, but uh, you'll see a line of stars almost in a perfect straight line and a hook that comes up and around and over. And they are beautiful. They stand out well. There's no question. When you're looking at it, you're going to go, wow, that's a coat hanger. Yeah. yeah. So when you're looking at a pair of 10 by 50s, this is what you're going to see. And I'm telling you, that is a perfectly straight line and a hook that comes up over the top. Now, if I was to compare that to the full moon, look at the size of the coat hanger compared to the full moon. Mm. So you're going to, you, you can't miss it. It's a huge target. Real easy to spot, real enjoyable to look at, and when you do see it, it's you're going, "Wow, it is a coat hanger! <laughs> like it's it's perfect." <clears throat> and of course, this is our typical. Let's get all set up for meteor shower. <laughs> 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 and we're looking the wrong way. <laughs> so that's our binocular target of the week from Bino Bud. Awesome. All right, <laughs> that's a good one. That's a good one. Oh, I know, bud. Okay. Thanks, Good Mike. Color. Good guy. All right. Um, we got a few photos to share and then a bit of an announcement on our closing. So uh, we'll get to the photos here now. Awesome target. Awesome to be able to view that. And it does look just like that. Okay. Uh, photos. Just bear with me. And I think we can start with uh, this one. Uh, open with photos. Well, let's start with this uh, really colorful one. Hey, that hey. looks great. That looks like a Renat. Doesn't it? Uh, I think it is. <laughs> uh, Renat Rosk Shelton sent this one in uh, uh, Full Moon City with Maria. I'm hearing myself, guys. I'm not sure why. Yeah, you're echoing. Yeah. We're good. Just turn your volume down a little bit on the mic. Down? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. A second here. There. How's that better? No. No, you still have to. You, got, you must have two things going. Two things uh, volume wise must be turned up. Mm -hmm. Desktop audio is turned down. There. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. That's... Yeah, you're good. Sounds good. All right. Yeah. Uh, Full Moon City with Maria. Uh, full moon near the horizon can appear supersized under certain atmospheric or astronomical conditions, he says. With normal eyesight, here we go again. Uh, specific geologic surface features of the lunar surface can actually be observed from Earth without the use of special equipment on the visible side of the moon. 
I'm still hearing still myself. Hearing myself. Sound good here. Okay. Among so, such uh, features are mares or oceans, uh, giant flat giant areas, areas and depressions, or, or giant craters, giant on, craters on the moon, on. which have which a have different, a different reflective, reflective light signature, signature from their surroundings. From their surroundings. Uh, the scarring, uh, the scarring of the moon's surface, surface has its equivalent in the colorful maritime architecture of a mature harbor city like St. John, New Brunswick, Canada, which adds texture and interesting shadow patterns. So, that's that. Awesome, Renat. Very nice. Yeah, that's beautiful. And you can find her stuff at renatart.com. Uh, Kathy uh, Adams sent this one in. Boy, that's echoing that's a little bit. Try to get down a bit more. Still okay, guys? Yeah. Still hear myself. <laughs> Everything seems fine at this end. <laughs> okay, we'll try it anyway. Uh, Kathy Adams says, I was out the same night that you uh, uh, posted about Venus and Mercury. My vantage point uh, didn't let me see Venus. But I'm pretty sure I did see Mercury. We have had some beautiful sunrises and sunsets lately. I love watching the colors change as the night goes on. And there was a beautiful rainbow around the sun. She said. So let's take a peek through here. Very nice. Nice, huh? Oh, gorgeous. Oh, the colors. Love that type of night. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, I think that's good. Uh, Lisa hi, sent this Lisa. one in. <clears throat> Lisa Fanning. Uh, hi, Chris. I was enjoying tonight's moon, and I thought I'd share one of my favorite shots from tonight. Um, uh, May 13th, she says. Wax, waxing crescent, 4% illuminated, two-day-old moon taken from central New Jersey at 8.23 p.m. Eastern time. Awesome. Oh, beautiful. Very nice, Lisa. I guess there is still a little echo out there on Facebook, but I don't hear it at my end. Yeah, I, I hear it here. That's okay. You're still eligible. Okay. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, Kathy. Kathy again. She says, after months of dodging trees, I realized that two doors down the Legion uh, has a wide open sky. I got the crescent moon and I think Mercury even saw a bit of earth shine, she says. Yep. Hopefully more clear skies are on the way. So let's take a look here. Here. Oh, nice. Great shots, Kathy. Yeah, absolutely. Love Urshine. Uh, Stefan Picard sent this one in. I captured Jupiter Friday morning. My first capture uh, stack where I most mostly did right steps to finally pull out the cloud bands. It's been a little less than a year since I started astronomy. I reflected on where I started and where I am now. I've come a long way but I still have so much to learn and so much more to see, which is why I continue. It never ends. A beautiful shot. Yeah, yeah, yes. Turn that light way down. Yeah, do you have speakers there besides that? No, no, not at all. Yeah, there's something I'll be it up. Because I muted my microphone and it fell off. Let me put my mic in turn. Yeah. So they can live with the echo. It's just voice the pleasure. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> okay. Carry on. Cher made a lot of money with uh, reverberation and echo. <laughs> yeah. You believe in love, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're not sure. <laughs> Um, hi, Chris. Apologies for a second email, but I was <clears throat> going through my captures on my DSLR from yesterday morning at 3 a.m. This is from Stefan again. And I realized I did capture Andromeda Galaxy at a fairly visible level. You'll see it midway up the left-hand side by the tree. Yeah. There it is. Is this sitting now? Hmm. Wow. Nice shot. Uh, next time I'll go for M31. I'll use a longer focus length lens and see if I can... Uh, really have better results. So sorry about the sound here, folks. Uh, try this. <clears throat> okay, on. Uh, this was from uh, Marlene Wells. The Earthshine was amazing, she said, last night. Uh, her data was 0.3 seconds at f5.5. 
5.6, uh, ISO uh, 6400. You guys hearing me there now? Yeah, I'm hearing you clear now. Okay, so that's right. whatever happened uh, just went away. That's good. Great. Um, 300 millimeters, she said Canon EOS uh, 70D, uh, EF uh, 75 to 300 millimeter lens. So. Very nice. Awesome. Very nice, Marlene. She also got some nice stars in there, in there too, hey? Lots yes. of stars all over that image. It's beautiful. Yeah. Really nice. Um, here we got uh, Carol Bean. Uh, Carol says the moon and Mercury at dusk. Uh, last evening she had a uh, Canon 60D 70 to 200 millimeter lens at 70 millimeter. A quarter of a second at f4. And I've got some more here. Just hang on a second. Jamie, I don't know why I missed Jamie's pictures again tonight, but I did. Jamie, I apologize. <laughs> I'm sure I did miss them. Okay, got Brenda Baird here. She said I managed to grab a few pics myself. One second, we find her pictures now. Just a second here. Sorry, get myself mixed up here. Carol's Renat. This, this one was from Renat. Sorry, this one was from Renat. I'm still getting an echo. Yeah, uh, these ones are from Brenda. Uh, managed to grab a few pics myself, she said, of the uh, crescent moon with her wow. shine. Nice, nicely done. Yeah, this one came from Tim Doucette, uh, Moon and Mercury together. Oh. Jim. Awesome. Now, just bear with me for a second. I remember that uh, oh. exact thing because of the clouds. Um, yeah, that's awesome. Just bear with me. Uh, I've got to do this. Hang on just a sec, folks. And I go because I have to share these ones. We can wrap while you're doing that. Well, yeah, that'd be good. Yeah. <laughs> this is from Jamie. <laughs> Jamie, why not? Um, she sent this oh, one and I didn't nice. get it included on my uh, list of photos for some reason. I was working on a presentation for a, a bunch of school kids tomorrow, too, so I apologize for that. And right. I think I've got another here. Second here. Sure, I do. This, uh, second one. Lots of detail there. Oh, yeah. That's beautiful. Picture. Very well done. Yeah. And a third, just uh, one second. I'm actually bringing these up on my Facebook page. This one is actually a Vega, she said. <clears throat> bright Star Vega. Yes, there it is. Which, okay, I see it. Nice. Which, which gets very bright. <laughs> it is, too. Awesome. Thank you, Jamie. Um, well done. Now, what else did I have? I think that was it, except for this one, I guess. Which is, of course, the uh, send your email, send your pictures to Sunday Night Astronomy Show at gmail.com. And we would love to get them. That's all I get to say about that there. <clears throat> Thank you, everybody, for the photos. Really appreciate that. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> Todd, uh, Todd's asking how to submit photos. So, Todd, you can submit them to Sunday Night Astronomy Show at gmail.com. Or you can send them into my Facebook page, Astronomy by the Bay, and I can certainly collect them from there as well. Most times I get them. Sometimes I miss. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so in closing tonight, folks, um, just a second, I want to go to full screen here. We are going to mention a little something here. Uh, first, thanks, first of all, for all your continued support out there. Thanks again to Rosanna for her continued contribution to our show. We really do appreciate all your efforts out there in helping us bring the show uh, together. Remember, we do love getting your photos, so send them to Sunday Night Astronomy Show at gmail.com or just send it to my Facebook page, and we'll be happy to include them in our broadcast. 
We're also looking for suggestions for topics for future shows. If you have anything you would like us to discuss in a future episode, please send your request to the same address, Sunday Night Astronomy Show at gmail.com, and we'll do our best to make it happen for you. We also ask that if you enjoyed the material here tonight and you joined us from YouTube, please consider giving us a like and subscribing to our channel. Please let your family and friends know that we are going to be here um, most nights <laughs> to help educate you on the night sky. And that leads us to our next uh, topic that uh, we've been a little over a year and a half now on the, on the program. So we're going to take a break next week. Uh, it's a long weekend coming up. So we're going to uh, take the weekend and uh, enjoy some uh, private time, I guess. So we'll be back to see you again in two weeks' time. So for now then, from Mike and Paul and I, uh, stay safe, everyone. We wish you all clear skies, and we hope to see you again here in two weeks' time. Two weeks. Two Thanks, weeks everyone. <laughs> One fortnight is two weeks. <laughs> okay, a fortnight. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry about the echo, one, folks. We'll see you again in two weeks' time. All right. And Cue the music. Keep your scopes, guys. Point it up. Point it up. <laughs> two weeks, two weeks, two weeks. And good night, everyone. See you in two weeks. <laughs>